So welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is Dan Geshwind. I direct the Institute for Precision Health. And it's my really uh, great pleasure to introduce my colleague, uh, Manish Butte, who is going to give uh, the distinguished uh, lecture today. He's the Richard Stein Endowed Chair and Associate Professor in the Department of Pediatrics. He's Division Chief in Immunology, Allergy, and Rheumatology. He, I'll give you a little bit of history. He, uh, I think he, it, it looks like he was in the uh, six or seven year medical program and that he did his uh, BA in physics in Brown. And then three years later had his MD in medicine from Brown as well. Um, and making him a very early starter. Um, and he's continued to bloom. He got his PhD in biophysics at UCSF in the year 2000, followed by residency in pediatrics at CHOP, Philly. Um, what, uh, around that time, he also won the American Academy of Pediatrics Resident Research Award. Um, and I should say he also got a prize in physics as an undergrad. So he then, you know, he, he, he graduated with his PhD. He, he finished his residency and then a clinical fellowship in allergy and immunology at Boston Children's. And then at Harvard, he did postdoctoral work on T cell inhibitory pathways and chemistry. Um, he spent his junior faculty years following that at Stanford from 2009 to 2016, where he was also recognized with several awards, including the Faculty Mentor of the Year Award from the Immunology Faculty and a Faculty Scholar Award in Pediatrics. We were able to recruit him to UCLA to pediatrics in 2016 as the division chief of pediatrics. Um, and in 2019, he received the Richard Stein Endowed Chair. He's also an elected fellow of the Clinical Immunology Society and the American Society of Clinical Investigation. I view him as exemplary physician scientist, one of the best examples, certainly on our campus. He has expertise across biophysics, genetics, and immunology. He's a pioneer in mechanobiology and uses atomic force microscopy and other methods to understand how mechanical changes influence signaling in immune cells. But he's also a pioneer outside of his lab in making significant discoveries using genetic investigation of his patients. It's not opportunistic work. It's work that is focused on using everything that he knows and his own research laboratory to help patients with severe clinical problems with undiagnosed disorders who have nowhere else to go. This work occurs in the context of a, of a larger framework uh, in undiag the Undiagnosed Disease Center um, and the California Center for Rare Diseases at UCLA with his other colleagues. And it really demonstrates the power of genetics to characterize patients with undiagnosed diseases and in Dr. Butte's case, a wide variety of immunological conditions. I think it's really the future of medicine. And um, you know, it's really wonderful uh, that we were able to cajole uh, Manish to give this talk here today, uh, twist his arm actually. Um, so Manish, the floor is all yours. I apologize for the lengthy introduction, but I feel like it was well-deserved. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. I really appreciate it. And you know, I'm, all, I'm always grateful to to, for the chance to share what we've been working on for the last few years. Uh, just to note, this uh, seminar was originally intended for an in invitation for an outside speaker and um, because of COVID had to cancel. So we're, we're eager to get Stuart Turvey from um, the University of British Columbia back in next year's cycle. Hopefully, hopefully COVID will be over by then. <laughs> Uh, but anyway, I'm going to share uh, a topic that is near and dear to my heart, which is uh, learning about genetics and immunology from patients who have infections. Uh, you know, we're often consulted in the hospital and, uh, on patients who have severe infections, and it's uh, a chance for us to learn a little bit about how the immune system works. In fact, the discovery of immunoglobulins and of B cells and of many pathways that we now teach to our immunology students and, and medical students were learned from patients who showed up with defects of those pathways. And I, I think it's a, a great chance whenever we see patients with severe infections to think about uh, what went wrong uh, inside. These are, in a way, experiments of nature that land in our lap and give us a chance to learn a little bit about um, how the immune system is regulated. 
So I'm gonna share a little bit of a story. There's no conflicts of interest, but I will talk about some off-label use of drugs. Um, uh, and, you know, really to think about infection and when, when infection goes awry, we have to understand infection and when infection goes right. And, uh, you know, at the risk of making an arbitrary definition, I would say that immunocompetence uh, involves the idea that you can get an infection and bring yourself back into a state of healing uh, with or without symptoms, uh, but without intervention, without any antibiotics or anything like that, hospitalization. If you can return back to your homeostatic baseline, then we will call that immunocompetence. Um, and at the extreme end of non-immunocompetence then are people who die from infection. Anyone who dies from infection as a corollary of this definition is Im not immunocompetent, has some kind of immune deficiency. Of course, many of them are primary or genetic immune deficiency. Some of them are secondary. Still, nonetheless, those immune deficiencies give us a chance to understand uh, if this fungus is causing death in a patient, what pathway is needed in humans to protect from that fungus? And that's sort of the vantage point that we take when we think about patients who get sick and who die. So whenever patients die from infection, we always have to ask ourselves why. <laughs> why are some people dying from infection? Uh, of course, the, 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 the big killers of humanity like malaria and tuberculosis uh, actually aren't big killers of humanity when it comes down to uh, individual communities and measuring the incidence of infection versus the, the um, frequency of death is actually um, surprisingly very low numbers of people die from any one infection. Even COVID, you know, uh, now a great killer of humanity in the, uh, in the early 21st century here, kills only about 0.2, maybe 0.3% of those who would get infected. Um, and all the other patients that we take are in the hospital with staff and strep and candida and everything else, uh, even lower rates of infection um, uh, mortality. So why are some people then getting COVID and dying? Why are some people getting TB and dying? Why are some people getting plasmodium, malaria and dying? Uh, what, what, what it causes that tiny fraction of people to actually go on and having susceptibility? Uh, and that really is the vantage point that we are approaching uh, questions. And we're gonna talk about some uh, common infections like these and think about what we can learn about the immune system and rare diseases uh, from, the, from, from those patients who are rarely dying from these diseases. Um, to paint with an uh, extraordinarily broad brush, uh, we'll say that genetic variation is the cause of that heterogeneity in infection outcomes. Um, and we've been thinking about in genetic causes uh, or inheritable causes as susceptibility to infection uh, as the cause for susceptibility to infection for, for decades. Uh, in fact, this study from 1988 from a Scandinavian group looked at adoption records, uh, a really interesting way of approaching the question that when a child who is an adoptee dies, uh, then you can ask what their parents died of at a similar age. So if a child dies at, uh, if the adoptee dies at age 40, you can ask what's the chances their parents died of that same cause uh, you know, um, at, at a certain age. And it turns out that if you look at cancer and natural causes uh, writ large, there are very, very low correlation that the parents and the, and the biological child um, died of the same thing. But for infection, there's a significant, uh, almost six-fold increase in the risk uh, if a biological parent died of an infection that the adoptee will also die um, of infection. So we do think that there is a, a strong um, nature rather than nurture influence for infection susceptibility. Uh, other studies have uh, borne this out too. Just, you know, we've been doing, looking at tuberculosis for, for decades, uh, for even probably for a century, uh, a study in the 70s and, and, and that has been recapitulated uh, time and again, supports the idea that monozygotic or identical twins who share the same genomes have a much higher concordance rate of, of infection susceptibility than dizygotic twins. And there are many, many such studies. Uh, and, you know, to, the take home point I think is that, uh, that infection susceptibility is genetic. Now, what is monogenetic or primary immune deficiencies versus, um, versus uh, these sort of not rare disorders that lead to infection susceptibility becomes the, an interesting question. And one way of thinking about that question is this interesting graph from, from one of our colleagues, John Lauren Casanova at Rockefeller, who published review articles this year suggesting that primary infections that lead to life-threatening disease in early in life are likely to be monogenic uh, single gene variants here. Whereas as patients get older on the spectrum of age, uh, 
uh, the infections that lead to uh, high mortality, life-threatening infections are less likely to be rare variants with high effect size uh, leading to, to that disease susceptibility. And instead, we expect to see more common variants with low effect size individually that lead to a susceptibility or predisposition to, to infection. And, and so if genetic factors writ large are the risk for infection and bad outcomes from infection, how do we then dissect into rare diseases when we think about some of these ones on the left and common variants as we think about the ones on the right uh, to, to really uh, ascertain then what is the underlying cause? What can we learn about the immune system from these variants, rare or common? And uh, I think that that part is really the fun part because every case then becomes an instruction. We don't really have to make big cohorts of patients to try to understand things. We can dive into one individual case, uh, a young kid who gets some sort of severe infection and learn something about the immune system. And I, I think that's what makes, uh, makes it fun for me. So we're working on two common infections in, in, in my, um, my larger orbit. And I'm gonna share with you a story about coccidiomycosis, which is a, an endemic fungal infection and um, we also work on another common infection, COVID, and uh, I don't think we're going to have time to talk about that today, but certainly, um, you know, there's a lot that we've learned about infection susceptibility in COVID that, um, that really can help explain why some people are getting sick and most people don't. So the case that I'm going to share with you about Coxie um, was published now uh, a year and a half ago, and it entails a four-year-old boy who came to UCLA with this lesion on the back of his neck and uh, these giant lumps on his forehead and on, the, on his scalp uh, that were very tender, very painful. And when biopsy showed this uh, characteristic pathology of a spherule that's full of these little um, fungal endospores uh, surrounded by a multinucleated giant cell. Uh, so this, this phagocyte or, or macrophage here has uh, engulfed one of these spherules. This was taken from the scalp lesion. This is diagnostic for a fungal infection called uh, coccidiodomycosis. And coxy really has its history um, uh, now uh, almost 200 years ago, oh, sorry, 100 years ago, uh, from uh, uh, Dr. Alejandro Posadas, whose uh, picture is shown here with his brilliant mustache, and uh, who was a, one of the early trained pathologists to come up with stains that stain fungi and found uh, these cereals in a patient that he was taking care of, a soldier who crossed the border into Argentina. Uh, this un unfortunate uh, guy whose head is stored in a jar uh, that I got to see in, in, in Buenos Aires. This uh, soldier had this lesion on his cheek here. You can see that I'm, I'm highlighting with my mouse. This lesion on his cheek was uh, thought to be some kind of skin cancer. There were biopsies done, and now with these new stains and new microscopes, um, Posadas thought that he had found a fungal etiology for skin cancer, for, uh, for some sort of uh, T-cell skin cancer, actually. Um, of course, it wasn't a skin cancer. Of course, it was um, actually a fungal uh, dissemination of a fungal disease, coccidiomycosis. And in, this is the display. You can see that um, uh, Domingo Scura's hands and feet also had lesions on them. And he ended up dying uh, a few years later uh, with disseminated coxy. So this is the first uh, case of coxy published and the first disseminated case of coxy published. And uh, in fact, coxy is not just in Argentina and, and in Uruguay, but also uh, follows, has cases all the way up into North America. Uh, there are other endemic fungi in the world too that you can see highlighted from this uh, review article that uh, probably will share some interesting story uh, bits uh, as, as, we, as we learn about coxie over the next few minutes. Uh, zooming in, of course, to California, we can think about um, cases here. This is a um, not super rare disease. We have about uh, seven to eight and in some years, 9,000, almost 9,000 cases of, of COXI a year. These are not uh, disseminated cases. These are just uh, reported cases. And, uh, and I'll explain to you what, what I mean by that. But the disseminated uh, portion of these is about uh, um, 200 a year. And our, our state spends quite a bit on these cases of COXI. So for each disseminated case, like the uh, Escura that you just saw a minute ago, uh, we're spending about $190 million, about a million dollars per patient per year with disseminated coxie in direct costs. Those are hospitals and antibiotics and et cetera, antifungals. And then another half million per person per year um, uh, in indirect costs. So with, with these disseminated cases, we're spending about $300 million a year in California and with the other uh, non-disseminated cases, another $700 million a year. This is close to a billion dollars a year for, for the California healthcare system. And it's a, it's a significant problem. Um, 
when you zoom in even further to California, you can see that actually a significant number of cases, oh, sorry, one important point here is that we're getting on average in California about 20 cases per 100,000 individuals. But if you zoom in further, you'll see that in Kern County, sort of the, epi, uh, the epicenter of COXI, uh, it's actually more than 15 times that amount, um, 304 cases uh, per 100,000 last year in Kern County. Uh, LA County is down here. Uh, this is Santa Monica where I am. And the other end of the valley is, um, has uh, UC Davis and they collect cases as well. Uh, and so I'm gonna share with you data over the, over, uh, towards the end of this talk about uh, cohorts that we've assembled from our colleagues who are working in Kern County and then also at UC Davis. Um, when you get to the point of 300 per 100,000, it's really not that rare of a disease. And, um, and I'll share with you some context. This is the United States today and, and COVID infections taken from the New York Times a few, uh, few hours ago. In the very hottest hotspot of the United States today, with Omicron washing over virtually every bit of, of, the, of the country at this point, uh, the hottest hotspot today happens to be Kansas, and they have uh, 350 per 100,000 uh, cases. So imagine um, a COVID level uh, frequency or incidence of disease occurring for a coxy in Kern County year after year after year after year. Uh, and you'll get the idea that this is not a rare disease. In fact, in Arizona, about one third of all um, community acquired pneumonias are probably uh, valley fever or coxy. And when we think about coxy and the, and the phenotype then of the infection, it, it's very interesting, like COVID, that a huge number of the patients are asymptomatic. We know this from studies of patients who come to military, uh, to work in the military in California uh, from a site where the, there is no COXI. And then they can be tracked and they were tracked for many years, uh, decades ago and found to be COXI um, serology or, or T cell uh, um, delayed type representativity positive, uh, even though they never had any clinical disease. So we know uh, over half or just over half of the patients have no uh, clinical phenotype. About a third of patients go on to getting what's called valley fever. Uh, and and, and uh, valley fever is a, is a pneumonia Pneumonia. And it's a self-limited pneumonia. Many patients uh, require just fluconazole for treatment, and um, they can be treated for a short amount of time, a few weeks to months, and then they can be taken off fluconazole and the disease doesn't recur. Uh, and, and those patients we call uncomplicated valley fever, uh, which you'll hear about more uh, in a few minutes. Some patients go on to having um, persistent lung disease. Uh, or, or progressive lung disease. Uh, they don't, it's not self-limited. Some patients end up having uh, ongoing nodular disease in their lungs. But the really interesting phenotype is this dissemination. The, the original case that I showed you uh, left the lungs, went to other tissues in the body, to bones, to skin, to the meninges, uh, at which point it becomes extraordinarily fatal. Uh, in historical studies, just in the last uh, decade or so, the fatality rate is uh, on, on the order of 40% if it goes into the meninges and maybe a little bit lower if it's not uh, if it's just confined to uh, a few other uh, extra pulmonary sites. Okay, so of this now rare fraction of patients who's going to having a, a, a severe disease, we, we can remember from that original definition, we could say those who are going on to having this very severe phenotype are certainly not immune competent. They are not returning back to their homeostatic baseline by themselves. Uh, they would die without intervention. And uh, then we start to dive into asking, well, who, who is getting sick? What are the factors that lead for them to get extraordinarily sick? Uh, remember, this is the question that we're trying to get at in, in immunology of, of rare diseases or rare phenotypes here. Um, so pregnancy turns out to be very high on the list. About one third of the patients who get pregnancy, especially in the third trimester, go on to dissemination and a third of them die. This is a, a very high uh, badness rate to get uh, coxie in, your, in the uh, late late pregnancy. Immunosuppression, certainly um, the patients who undergo uh, chemical immunosuppression during uh, or after solid organ transplants or patients who get chemotherapy for cancer and suppress uh, some immune function are known to be at high risk of getting disseminated disease. HIV is known to give risk for disseminated disease. And then we get into some of the weirder things, which we're gonna talk about uh, a little bit later. There is a lore, the, a 50 year lore at this point of uh, males having a higher susceptibility to disseminated disease. There is a very strong literature from our colleagues in Kern County in Arizona and other places that suggests that African-Americans and Filipinos have a higher incidence of, of disseminated disease. 
we want to we want to understand why. Why is it that there may be some uh, people who have a higher susceptibility? Uh, an obvious answer you could give is is it's based on exposure. If you're in those areas where uh, valley fever, where the fungal spores are in the soils, then maybe if people uh, who are African Americans are enriched uh, uh, um, population wise in those areas, and they may have higher exposure, and therefore a higher um, uh, fraction of them may have a, a disease, uh, a severe disease state. Let's dig into that. So we're going to try to understand a little bit more about this um, this this lore here. And then there are the extremely rare genetic immune deficiency cases. And there were eight cases collected by Steve Holland at the NIH a few years ago. Um, and, and they're listed here. This is a paper that published now, yeah, in 2017. And in, interestingly, you can categorize these immune defects by, um, by those patients who have defective type one immunity. So type one immunity is one of the large uh, uh, transcriptional programs that, that the immune system will run if it's fighting a certain type of pathogen. Imagine you know you're going to launch an app on your computer, and if you're going to be writing a letter, you're going to launch Microsoft Word. So imagine Microsoft Word is is type one immunity. Uh, you know, and if you can't make Microsoft Word, if, if if you didn't download it or if it's not running properly, if your keyboard's not working, you may not be able to then get a letter written. And and there are defects in the IL-12 receptor, the key cytokine that's needed to make type one immunity, in interferon gamma receptor, the key receptor, uh, the key cytokine and its receptor that are important for signaling in type one immunity. And STAT1, which is downstream of the, of the interferon receptor, uh, all of which produced patients who had severe coxie. Interesting, many of them had bony and skeletal disease. Two other cases that he collected were patients who had excessive type two immunity. So type two immunity is the other program you can run, another program you can run in your immune system. It's largely uh, been evolutionarily written to protect us from parasitic infections and also for allergies. Um, and interestingly, these patients with STAT3 loss of function and uh, hyper IgE syndrome, a phenotype of type, uh, excessive type two immunity had meningitis as their phenotype. So immediately, even from these small number of cases, you can see um, that these patients who have either excessive type one immunity or, or defective, sorry, excessive type two immunity or defective type one immunity, um, that balance is being off, will, may have a higher risk of uh, coxie. In fact, this was known uh, 30 years before. Uh, uh, in fact, folks have studied the levels of IgE, either eosinophilia, total IgE, or coxie-specific IgE. And when those are elevated, there's a higher chance of developing extrapulmonary or disseminated disease. So why is excessive type 2 immunity a risk factor? I'm, I'm stealing this figure from a group that has worked on um, uh, uh, cryptococcus, cryptococcus neoformans, another fungal infection that has a sort of similar pattern in terms of um, a lung and meningitis and et cetera. Um, and in this case, though, I think that the story is, is very similar, that, um, that these pathogens can uh, drive the activation of, of the lung epithelial cells, the sensors of infection, because they produce uh, in their wall of the fungal um, uh, uh, spherule uh, uh, sugar barrier called chitin. It's a, it's a polymer of sugar. And, uh, and it's a wall that keeps um, immune cells from attacking and, and destroying these, these um, spherules. Chitin itself can be digested. We make enzymes in our lungs to digest fungal um, chitins and to then sense those chitins by a receptor. The receptor is called Dectin-1. We're going to come back to that at the very end. Don't let me forget. Uh, when Dectin-1 is turned on, that creates alarm signals inside of the lungs uh, in the epithelial cells. One of those alarmins is called TSLP. And TSLP turns on dendritic cells in the lungs that, and in uh, type two lymphoid cells that produce IL-4, and that IL-4 turns on T cells to become type two immunity. Uh, those type two immune cells uh, will help uh, B cells make IgE and create all the rest of the um, type two response that we think about. These um, T cells will also produce IL-4 that tells the macrophages, the innate immune system to, um, uh, to be able to fight uh, infections. But in this case, it skews macrophages away from their ability to fight into a mode called M2. Macrophages can be type one or type two. And when they become type two, uh, they are not so good at fighting in fungi. And that has been shown in mouse models uh, in for cryptococcus, for candida, for paracoxy and coxy, for histoplasma and for aspergillus. So a variety of different types of both molds, uh, yeast and, and, and other fungi all seem to have this important need for type one skewed macrophages if you're gonna clear them. Okay, so if this is the story that we know that type two immunity is a risk factor for fungal infections, 
um, and, and maybe driven by some uh, abnormal sensing and signaling in this pathway, uh, we should try to understand are some individuals more susceptible to type 2 skewing, and we're going to come back to that uh, over the course of this case. But back to the case, this is the PET scan of our four-year-old boy uh, uh, after his admission, and you can see that he had lesions in his scalp, as you saw in his uh, clavicle, sternum, ribs, wrists, uh, tibia, etc. This is his, one of his wrists. You can see this part here was lit up on the bone scan. It looks a little bit wider than the contralateral side. And a few weeks later, this bursts through the skin. Extraordinarily painful, very destructive uh, fungus that can eat tissue, soft tissue, um, uh, easily. Um, these have to be debrided surgically, and our little friend went to the operating room a number of times to, to remove these lesions uh, from his, uh, from his um, limbs, and uh, etc. His, his spine had a lesion that grew very rapidly and destroyed one of his vertebrae. You can see it led uh, to collapse here of the vertebrae and some scoliosis later. This is a very bad infection. This is happening while he's on three antifungals, or sorry, two antifungals, and, um, and we really were unable to control his disease. So we, we followed some processes thinking about like rare diseases and um, well, there's a question about why PET scan picks up fungal lesions. It's not picking up the fungal lesions, it's picking up um, uh, uh, cells that are uh, attracted to these lesions that are uh, metabolizing glucose, like T cells and, and neutrophils. Um, so IL-12 signaling uh, through STAF-4 was one of the lesions, uh, the deficiencies that Steve Holland identified. And we looked for that in our patient, took whole blood, gave IL-12, looked for phosphorylation of STAF-4. And what we found in our, in our little friend was that he had very low signaling of IL-12. Um, and so this was an interesting hint that maybe he had a genetic or, or other defect of IL-12 that was leading him to not be able to make type 1 immunity. So just now we go back to our uh, lesson books and think about how T cells need IL-12 because uh, naive helper T cells, when they receive IL-12 in the context of, of TCR stimulation, will undergo a, um, a, a transcriptional program uh, driven by the, the transcription factor TBET that turns on the key cytokine called interferon gamma. So remember um, interferon gamma because it is the major cytokine that, that, that then tells macrophages to become M1 and to eat up fungi and clear these infections. <clears throat> um, so our prediction would be that in our guy, when we see low IL-12, that we should see low Th1 cells and low amounts of interferon gamma being made. Uh, how much is low? Uh, in you and me, we should see many times more Th1 cells than Th2 cells. There's some age distributions here, but in general, you can see four, six, eight times as many Th1 cells as Th2 cells is pretty normal. That's just the way uh, we are programmed to fight uh, fungi and bacteria and intracellular bacteria and viruses, which is what Th1 type 1 immunity does, more than parasites and allergies. There are some other uh, programs too that helper T cells can undergo, and we can talk about them in Q&A if, if people have questions. But, but we wanted to really dig into this question. Can we see a, a, a consequence of the low IL-12 signaling? And so um, in the lab, we cultured his T cells uh, with uh, stimulation for a week and asked how much Th1 cells does he make? And <clears throat> What we found is that he really had very low levels of Th1 cells. Uh, this is measuring by flow cytometry, interferon gamma on this axis, and IL-4 on this axis, or Th1 cells on this axis, and Th2 cells on this axis. And you can see the control patient had a two to one ratio in the right direction, and our uh, little friend had an eight to one ratio in the wrong direction. Uh, and so this was a very important hint that he wasn't making enough gamma because he couldn't signal through IL-12. We gave him IL-12 for a week uh, in culture, uh, his T cells, not him. And we found that we could rescue some of that signaling. That little tail of, of phosphorylation of STAF-4 that you saw uh, was meaningful, that we could actually give him some IL-12 uh, in vitro and, and show that we could rescue some function. And this was an important hint to us that, uh, that maybe we can do something about his disease. But first, he wasn't making enough gamma, so we gave him gamma. We took uh, a drug that's FDA approved for something else, and we used it for something else. And, and this is what we have to do in, in immunology is, is repurpose drugs for rare diseases. And we, we picked um, this drug and we started dosing him with it. And um, we picked, we ended at a dose when we really um, were a couple times higher than, than, the, than our starting point. And, and more importantly, we start to, started to see some improvement. His CRP, um, a, a measure of inflammation, plummeted over the next few weeks. 
Um, and some of his lesions got better. Uh, you can see here the lesions on his scalp. Um, this one consolidated and disappeared to, to had some surgical debridement as well. This one actually consolidated and got smaller. Whereas this one on the temporal side actually got bigger over the course of uh, his treatment with interferon gamma. And other uh, parts of his body uh, in his uh, bony disease, um, some parts got better and some parts got worse. So we were able to really slow down the, the, the rapid trajectory of his worsening disease, uh, but this was not a cure. And we still needed to figure out um, how to get him better. This is, for example, one of the lesions on the scalp that started to separate. This was an extraordinarily painful lesion at this point. Uh, so so painful that he um, really couldn't eat uh, and sleep, and he had to be fed by NG tube during this hospitalization. We were really um, struggling to keep him uh, going. So back to our T cell diagrams, which is where we always go whenever we're struggling. Uh, and we started to think about what he was making. He was making a lot of IL-4 uh, because he was making a lot of TH2 cells. And IL-4 we know actually suppresses the development of type one immunity. At the transcription factor level, GATA3 suppresses uh, some of the chromatin modifications needed to make type one cells. And IL-4 receptor signaling uh, blocks some um, IL-12 receptor and, and gamma receptor signaling. And so we were thinking maybe if he's making too much IL-4, that's what's slowing down his body from making um, Th1 cells. Uh, is there some way we can block IL-4 and increase Th1 uh, immunity for, for this guy? And uh, my colleague, Maria garcia Loret was um, uh, very astutely realized that the FDA had at that time just approved a new drug uh, called dupilumab, the trading is dupixin, that blocks the IL-4 and IL-13 receptors. It's a monoclonal and it blocks the IL-4 receptor alpha chain and it stops signaling through, through this receptor. Uh, it was FDA approved for at that time atopic dermatitis or eczema. And we're thinking, can we repurpose this drug uh, to uh, help his T cells make less IL-4 and sort of push his immune system to be sensing a little more of that IL-12 that might be circulating around. So we tried it in vitro. Uh, one of our nurses, um, uh, we, we got some dupixent uh, syringes. Uh, these syringes are locking syringes. So once the plunger goes in, it locks. So you can't uh, pop them open and steal the drug out of one of them. Uh, she had to go into the tissue culture and crack open a bunch of used syringes and pipe it out the tiny little droplet of fluid at the tip of the, of the, of the plunger. And we got about 20 of these and pulled a few hundred microliters of dupixent uh, and started to do in vitro experiments. And what we saw uh, is a rescue. We were able to rescue his, inner, his Th1 cells uh, and, and reduces Th2 cells just by treating his cells with dupilumab for a week. So this was a, an idea now that we thought we should practice in vivo. And indeed, we started him on dupilumab in vivo. We didn't know how to dose it experimentally. This is, um, there was no dosing regimen in place for four-year-olds. So we had to do it empirically. We treated him with various doses and escalated over time until we saw that treating his uh, ex vivo cells with IL-4 did not produce any stimulation through the IL-4 receptor. This tells us that he is fully blocked and that whatever amount of dupixin he's getting is enough to block signaling. So we thought that that was enough. Uh, but Importantly, not just looking at his signaling, looking at his disease, he started getting better. His T cells recovered up to his Th1 cells started to improve. His ratio actually went from eight to one in the wrong direction to one to one uh, over the course of a number of weeks. And more importantly, his lesions started to melt away. He had this giant acoxy epidural abscess here you can see in the middle while he was on interferon gamma. Uh, and shortly after starting dupilumab, um, a few weeks after starting dupilumab, his lesions melted away. His scalp lesions melted away. This is uh, right, right around the time that we started dupilumab. He had this extraordinarily painful lesion on his scalp and um, uh, things just improved. This is him on treatment in the hospital. He was able to start walking around. Uh, he got the NG tube out and um, this is him uh, after we discharged him home. Uh, and he is now uh, almost two years off uh, out of the hospital and doing very well. So our question uh, really then is, can we apply this kind of treatment to other severe viral, fungal, and bacterial infections, uh, even if there isn't a rare disease underlying them? Or maybe there should, maybe there is. Maybe everybody who's dying of coxy or dying of severe um, uh, def defects in type one immunity uh, has some sort of underlying defect. Uh, so we have to figure out his underlying defects still, and I'll show you what we've learned about him. But, um, but also maybe we should be using uh, uh, immunomodulation as an adjunct to antifungals, to antibacterials, to help push the immune system into a state where it can clear infections by itself or, or as an adjunct to antifungals and antibacterials uh, and antivirals. 
And what about blocking TSLP? No one's thought of this yet, but you know, TSLP is that main factor that pushes to type two immunity in the lungs. It's the main alarm in the lungs uh, in this case. And uh, the FDA just a couple of days ago, no, maybe a month ago, approved uh, a TSLP blocking monoclonal antibody from Amgen. Uh, it goes by this uh, very pronounceable name. Um, and we, um, we would love to start thinking about using that in, in severe um, coxie as well. Okay, so back to our case again. Uh, we did figure out, thanks to help from um, our colleagues in the Undiagnosed Disease Network, we did RNA sequencing and we were able to make an interesting finding. Uh, and to understand this finding, you have to understand the splicing of the IL-12 receptor. Remember the IL-12 receptor was functionally defective in our kit. We did look for genomic variants, rare genomic variants uh, all over the IL-12 receptor, uh, RB1, RB2, IL-12 itself. We couldn't find anything. Uh, interesting. However, when we looked at the transcriptome of his uh, whole blood and asked, let's, let, let's, let's look at this IL-12 receptor, we, we've made an interesting discovery. So the IL-12 receptor itself comes in two splice forms. Uh, this is exon 1, this is exon 2, 3, 4, all the way down. And the long isoform here has these extra exons, you can see. And the short isoform goes from this exon over to this uh, exon 9b, and, it, and that's where the transcript ends. We call this the short isoform. And you can see if we zoom in on this region, this exon can either go uh, to here or it can go to here. And if we look at transcripts then you know, on what's called a sashimi plot, you can see that um, the majority, the vast majority of his transcripts actually spliced over to this shorter isoform uh, exon and stopped. Whereas only about 6% of his transcripts went on to making the longer isoform. Now, uh, our way of thinking uh, for rare disease, even when we find transcriptional variants, is to then ask, well, what is the genomic variant that's causing the transcription to go awry? And we looked all over this region for any rare or even non-rare genomic variants, and we really couldn't find anything that could help us understand why he was splicing in this direction. Um, so what is the shorter isoform? Uh, Rich Robinson showed in uh, the Journal of Immunology, by the way, the short isoform is also made in mice, uh, that the short isoform is transcriptionally um, produces a form that does not have the transmembrane domain and doesn't have that key intracellular domain where JAK uh, kinases and stats are phosphorylated to turn on the transcription factor uh, that's needed for signaling. So the short isoform is non-signaling. And in fact, interestingly, you and I make the majority of our transcripts, not 94%, but around 60% of our transcripts are made in the short isoform. And uh, what Rich Robinson showed in, in other work is that as you stimulate T cells, uh, they, uh, especially through the type one immunity, um, they, they undergo transcriptional shifting from the short to long isoform. Uh, that allows more IL-12 signal. That allows making more interferon gamma. That allows a positive feedback loop uh, to making more and more uh, sensing of IL-12 and driving T cells then from this relatively undifferentiated state more and more and more towards type one immunity. This is one of the major transcriptional positive feedback loops that allows you and me to turn on type one immunity when IL-12 is sprinkled even at a low level in our T cells uh, that we become more and more receptive to that IL-12 over time. And this is why our friend, um, and, and, and little four-year-old friend didn't uh, wasn't able to turn on type one immunity. Um, I, I, I think I took out a slide here in the interest of time. How much? Yeah, we have a little bit of time still. Um, th that over time, over the next year, we followed his uh, transcriptome, and we found that he. Uh, under the influence of interferon gamma, um, was able to shift more and more of his uh, transcripts over to the longer isoform, and in fact, um, recovered IL-12 signaling uh, to an extent as well. And those figures are, are part of our paper. Um, so we're really, um, you know, we're happy that we were able to come up with a, a, a molecular uh, explanation as to why he was getting sick. And we decided based on that data um, to write a grant and we got funded to actually go looking for more patients like our, our, our friend here. Um, and so we, in collaboration with uh, the Valley Fever Institute, with Hal Hoffman at UC San Diego, who looked at innate immune cells and Mona Dorsey up at UCSF, we collected about 80 more patients um, with disseminated COXI and um, a couple dozen patients with uncomplicated Valley Fever. And again, those were from the Valley Fever Institute. Um, and the phenotypes were really um, diverse. We did collect quite a few patients who had meningitis as their phenotype. That happens to be um, something that was, you know, we'd love to be able to collect other phenotypes too, like skeletal. 
like our patient had, and we're diversifying our phenotype now over time. But you can see here, we got, we got a good number of patients with disseminated coxy, and, uh, and then we started stimulating them and, and studying them. And this is work from Tim and Terry in, in my lab. And we were able to find that actually a good number of patients, probably about 20% of them, have this elevated type two signal, like, like our friend did. Uh, where he had um, you know, an eight to one ratio. Here you could see one patient had a 10 to one, a couple had five to one, two and a half to one. Uh, remember the normal is to be way under one. Most all the, almost all the control subjects were well under one here. Um, so this was interesting. We think that these patients may represent a subset of disseminated coxie patients who would benefit from type two immune skewing to push them away from type two immunity, which they have a lot of back towards type one immunity. And in fact, we're going to be running clinical trials to study their T cells uh, and, uh, and to treat some patients with disseminated coxie with interferon gamma. Uh, in an open label study and with um, dupilumab uh, and to try to be able to push them uh, again away from type two immunity towards type one immunity. Those studies hopefully will be starting very soon. Um, we also had a discovery, and this is Tim and Terry again, that some of the T cells in these patients um, are exhausted. So many of you have heard of T cell exhaustion in the context of cancer. Uh, whenever T cells are exposed to an antigen week after week after week, uh, instead of continuing to fight to make cytokines, to, to proliferate, to, to respond uh, with, with the, the active uh, war that T cells can do, Instead, they back down, they give up, they start to upregulate uh, receptors that are inhibitory receptors, PD-1 is one of them, CTLA-4 is another, LAG-3, and, and there are others. This transcriptional and, and chromatin program called exhaustion is evolutionarily conserved. Uh, and it's probably because if you're not able to fight an infection and win over the course of about a week or two, then your T cells say, we need to give up. We can't keep making cytokines. We can't keep making fever because, you know, this organism, this person who's just shivering and febrile and looking sick and not feeling well, isn't going to go on to mate. And if they're not going to go on to mate, then we're not going to propagate our genes. So it's better to just turn off the immune response that's causing all that fever and chills and aches and anorexia and, and weight loss and turn off that program and let the person maybe look a little bit healthier and maybe they'll go on to pass, uh, pass on their genes before they succumb to the infection. So we know that this idea of chronic infection leading to exhaustion um, also exists, not just cancer, but chronic infection. Uh, chronic viral infections can lead to exhaustion in T cells. Um, we know the prototype uh, viral infection in mice called LCMV, uh, uh, clone 13, creates this phenotype. And we were surprised to find in disseminated COXI that a significant number of our individuals, each dot here as an individual, um, had elevations of PD-1 in their T cells uh, and this is both helper T cells and CD8 T cells uh, compared to our controls. Why? Why are they years and decades after getting disseminated coxy still having such a high level of T cell exhaustion going on? Uh, our best hypothesis is that they may have ongoing antigen exposure. And this would be sort of, uh, you know, an interesting thought because we don't really know if there are, or if there are latent reservoirs of COXI um, and, and, you know, we'd love to, maybe it's in those granulomas, maybe it's in those nodules that are in their lungs. Uh, maybe maybe we, we should go looking for the antigen source. And one, one idea we have is to use cell-free DNA and see if we can show evidence that they have ongoing COXI uh, in their bodies. Um, you know, we also saw elevations of these exhausted uh, T cells in our patients with uncomplicated value of fever. I'm not showing that here. Uh, and it's a subset of them. And it's an interesting point there is maybe in some of the patients, even if they clinically recover from COXI, they may still have some ongoing reservoirs of infection uh, of pathogen in their bodies that they haven't cleared. And, and we want to be able to track them down and, and see if that's, if that's true as well. Okay, so for the last part, I'm gonna jump into understanding the genetics a little bit about COXI. And I'm gonna go back to the question that I mentioned earlier about Filipinos and African-Americans and try to understand why this, this lore exists in the disseminated COXI literature about uh, susceptibility to disease. Now, this is a, a slide and, and these analyses come from our colleague, uh, Valerie Arboleta here, who's in the Department of Pathology of Physician Scientists who also studies genetic rare diseases. And I think it's really important because it helps us sort of put the framework on thinking about rare variants, like I talked about, these the ones that, that Steve Holland collected, extraordinarily rare allele frequencies that have high penetrance, high effect size, but they themselves are very rare. Uh, the frequencies of these highly pathogenic variants is not common. Um, 
we think that some of these ultra rare variants could create susceptibility to severe disease. Uh, but there could be other variants that are less rare. And, uh, and lesser variants, for example, could be ancestry specific variants, ones that, um, that, that are occurring at a level over 1%, for example. Uh, why would they cause the severe disease? Uh, well, think about, think about it this way, that even though at a populational level, the ancestry level, there may be, um, these variants may be uh, relatively common, but you have to take the intersection of that plus those people who get exposed to COXI, and, and maybe that creates a rare phenotype. Um, so we shouldn't throw away all these variants, even though they're not ultra rare, they still may be helpful to explain, uh, as I showed you in the beginning, uh, the, 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 the susceptibility to COXI infection and, and disease might be um, uniquely in this geographic region overlapped with a relatively common variant. And so the analysis that Valerie started taking, looking at these common variants, um, is based on other analyses that uh, folks have done looking at ancestry and, uh, and cancer and, and other types of diseases. And, um, and for this analysis, she used both the Valley Fever data that we've collected, uh, which is whole genome and whole exome sequencing data, but also exomes that were from our colleague at UC Davis, uh, George Thompson, and, um, and there are about almost 500 of those individuals as well. Uh, those individuals across the two cohorts here include both disseminated COXI and uncomplicated valley fever patients uh, you can see here, and have a variety of self-identified races and ethnicities. And at this point, it's important to, to sort of switch uh, to making sure that we understand what is self-identified race and ethnicity versus genetic ancestry. So self-identified race and ethnicity is the boxes that people check on, on, on forms uh, that, by based on self-identification. And they're subject to all the, all the flaws that forms can and half. Uh, do people check off two boxes when they may have a mixed uh, self-identification of race and ethnicity? Are the boxes adequately describing what they want? Um, and, and, and people make mistakes. They may not know, um, you know that much about their race and ethnicity. Uh, at the same time, um, genetic ancestry is not uh, uh, related to self-identified race and ethnicity. It doesn't always correlate. Uh, we determine this by principal components analysis, and this has to do with chromosomal segments uh, that happen to be passed on by chance, but where those segments cluster with individuals who self-identify uh, with different races and ethnicity in what's called the Thousand Genomes uh, Project. And so these are some of the races and ethnicities that are captured, self-identified terms and, and populations that are captured into the Thousand Genomes Project and then largely grouped into groupings called East Asians or Europeans or Africans or admixed Americans uh, and South Asians. Admixed Americans, for example, include uh, some subjects who come from, from UCLA's cohorts that we've uh, contributed to these uh, international databases. Um, and then if you take uh, individuals from the Thousand Genomes Project and put them up on a principal components analysis, you will find that, um, that South Asians cluster in, and East Asians and admixed Americans and Europeans, et cetera. This is two different principal components. This is two other principal components. So these are sort of different uh, hyperplanes splitting the, the data. And you can see that, um, that individuals from the Thousand Genome Project allow you to find uh, genetic ancestry or define genetic ancestry in this way. Uh, these are the COXI data, and uh, the COXI data, um, when we look at dissemination, uh, very interestingly clusters, you can see here in red, um, here on, on patients who have genetic ancestry as African. Uh, and we don't know why this is yet. This is a, a new finding, again, from Val and her graduate students, Sarah. Uh, and we really want to try to understand what are some of the alleles that have common alleles that have gone along with this uh, with this uh, um, genetic ancestry to try to understand, even though they're common, do they create a, a biochemical phenotype that allows us to think about disease susceptibility for COXI? There is a precedent for this way of thinking. Tuberculosis uh, is not a rare disease, but severe tuberculosis is. And John Ron Casanova's group looked at um, a not so rare variant, a variant that's um, captured, that's held by about 6% of Europeans. Uh, and um, and it, it changes the signaling of the IL-23 receptor a little bit, uh, but it's enough to be highly enriched in patients who have tuberculosis. Uh, and so there are, there are precedents in, in our world where we have found, where Casanova and others have found uh, not so rare variants that still create a slight biochemical, biochemical skewing that can then be used to explain why there is an a, a enrichment of, of disease in those uh, populations that carry that allele. Uh, 
Um, and so one way to dissect this is to not sort of put people into boxes, but ask how much of those boxes does each person have? That's like a proportional mix, uh, mixing. And asking, for example, each individual, if you were to try to put portions of their genetic ancestry into groups, then each individual may have a portion of their genetic ancestry as being African uh, here in red. Here you can see this individual has a little bit uh, of genetic, uh, uh, of alleles that map onto that, um, that group. Uh, these are all of our individuals, and if you group them, you can see that um, by self-identified, uh, sorry, by, by the genetic ancestry, the African uh, um, alleles are here, Am Amerindian or mixed uh, Americans here, U Europeans, etc. Um, this is now uh, a way of thinking about our individual subjects and the portions that they have of these different genetic ancestries. And we can then ask, do any of these fractions, maybe the African fractions, do they, um, genetic ancestry fractions, do they have a particular correlation with coxie. And indeed, uh, yes, we can find that among the patients who have disseminated coxie rather than those with uncomplicated valley fever, that you see more of this um, uh, admixture that, uh, that favors an African um, fraction, African genetic ancestry fraction. Uh, so we have to try to understand then what, again, what are the alleles in this, uh, that are carried in, this, in these patients, even, though, even if they have a limited portion of their genome as having those fractions, is there something conserved in common? And we started to do um, a little bit of that by looking at non-rare variants that differ in allele frequencies among the different genetic ancestry populations, and that help us understand disseminated versus undisseminated disease. And, and the first one we looked at, and we have a long way to go in this, is that dectin, uh, that, that um, chitin receptor that I mentioned in the beginning that I told you to remember. Uh, and um, indeed, we can find, um, if you look at the right-hand columns here, some patients with disseminate coxie versus um, frequency of these variants, these are the variants in the in this dectin receptor uh, versus the uncomplicated patients. You can see here, this one is four times as enriched in the disseminated patients as in the non-disseminated patients, and indeed also is enriched in the African um, genomic ancestry fractions versus the not. These as well, you can see here is over two-fold enrichment in the disseminated patients, and uh, again, a, a threefold uh, enrichment here in the African and et cetera. This is just the first sort of um, a strike that we've had at, at looking at um, variants that may be cluster or, 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 or enriched in these um, fractions. And it would, may help us understand the lore that has been passed on now for decades that there is a, an increased risk of disseminated disease among those with African genetic ancestry. So we're very excited to dive into this disease. Uh, I knew nothing about COXI uh, four or five years ago. Um, and because, you know, there's not much of it in Northern California where I was prior, and there's none of it in Philadelphia and Boston where I trained prior to that. And so I'm super excited to learn about this and to apply this kind of rare disease and common variant thinking to understanding it, to looking at innate immune responses, like in the, in the receptor and dectin, um, and in, to look at T-cell responses, to look at the genetics and the rare and common variants, look at splicing to try to understand if there are defects in splicing that could uh, help us understand why these genes have the impact on, on, on making patients who get coxie infection go on to having that disseminated path. And I'm very excited in the last 48 hours that we got um, a notice of a reward. This is always great news. Uh, to create this, a coalition with our colleagues in UC San Diego uh, to continue our, our experiments and to dive further. It's a U19 grant, and we're going to, for the next five years, dive into some of these questions here uh, that I've mentioned. And um, to give credit to all the people who've done the work, Tim, who is the project scientist in my lab and who really spearheaded all the T cell immunology, Terry, uh, who's a clinical fellow and has carried uh, on many of the T cell experiments, and Alexis, who's been uh, super important for gathering all these patients and their data. Uh, our friends in the Undiagnosed Disease Network who've helped us with the splicing analysis, Maria, who's really important for, for figuring out the dupilumab use, Monica, the clinical fellow who took care of uh, our patient and really uh, helped write the paper, Valerie and Bogdan and, and their groups who are now collaborating with us on the genetics. Thank you. Um, bravo, Manish, thank you very much. I'm gonna just launch into a few questions that are uh, sitting here uh, just, just for uh, time's sake. Um, so, mm -hmm. um, uh, here's one question. Um, uh, did the patient who um, need to be, you know, got treated, the boy um, kept on the treatment or the combination of interferon blocking IL-4 temporarily, was that enough to reset the immune system or is he had to be on that um, chronically? Um, so we, we have uh, weaned him down, uh, and we've actually treated two other kids with this same regimen at this point, and some adults as well now. 
Um, and, and we've been doing this informally just because these patients are desperate, uh, they're failing other treatments. Uh, we're trying to formalize it, as I mentioned, in the form of that clinical trial where we'll collect data and, and be able to publish it uh, in an orderly fashion. But, but to answer your question, we have um, come up with this idea that we should give them interferon gamma from the beginning to get them into a type one program, to give them dupilumab if they have that type two skewing. Um, and, and that way you rescue their macrophage differentiation right from the beginning, give them the dupilumab to skew their T cells more towards type one immunity if they have a defect in that direction. Uh, and then slowly to wean off the interferon gamma, which has more toxicity and leave them on dupilumab for longer. We, we have not weaned uh, any of our patients off uh, entirely. Um, fortunately, dupilumab is an extraordinarily well-tolerated monoclonal. It's being used for eczema and asthma. Uh, and, um, and so we haven't had a, any great impetus to take them off. Um, but yeah, so to answer your question, no, we haven't taken them off. Very interesting. Yeah, and then there was a question from Bogdan Pasanuik, um with respect okay. to ancestry analysis. Are there known environmental socioeconomic factors that may differ by ancestry that could also contribute to differences in disease by ancestry? Of course, you alluded to that. I want to add uh, something onto that with that last uh, table that you showed with the increase in several of the variants in African ancestry and an increase in those with disseminated COXI. One way to begin to look at that would be to stratify into those just with African ancestry yeah. and ask within those with African ancestry who have disseminated COXI and those that don't, do you actually see that increase in that allele? In those alleles, exactly right, and, and we want to be able to do that. Um, but you haven't end. been able to do that yet. Too small numbers, no. or no, not 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 enough time. Yeah, this is uh, yeah, just even getting the data from UC Davis, which is what catalyzed us from having uh, about eighty or hundred patients of our own to now having five hundred and being able to make those analyses meaningful. That that um, that had, that has taken quite a while with data use and be able to get the data down here. Uh, took a little bit of a while, but yeah, we're, we're definitely want to move on to the things to specifically answer Bogdan's question. I think um, the heart that is the heart of the the lore. I think is that there is an enrichment socioeconomically of certain uh, individuals in, in these parts of California. Uh, if you are working in a largely agricultural area, you're going to find a different so that socioeconomic. Um, uh, situation of, of working in agriculture, you're going to find different um, people who get uh, to who get into those jobs. Uh, the environmental risks of working in agriculture or working in construction are much higher. Uh, we happen to have located many of the prisons in California in the Central Valley of California, and we all know that there are um, racial and socioeconomic differences in the populations of prisons, as even California and nationwide. That also creates risks. And so, um, yeah, I do think that the socioeconomics of, of enrichment of people into these regions may be enough to, to do, um, to create these effects. We have to obviously try to decouple that as best we can and try to bust some of these myths if, if possible. Yeah, another question. Do individuals with higher native TH2 predominance, this is from Ben Ye, um, have increased rates of allergies? Right, so that, that's a great question. Yeah, um, you know, we think about now, the, back when we were in med school, we talked about TH1 and TH2 balance and how TH2 is for people who have increased allergies. Uh, I, I personally, in the last few years, moved away from that paradigm, and I think most people did, uh, because if you dive into patients with severe asthma, for example, you don't always find TH2 disease. In fact, you, you, you didn't uh, often find TH2 disease. And there were enough examples uh, in, in allergic disease and severe allergic disease where we, where we had to move away from that type 1, type 2 model that was sort of popular in the 90s. Um, uh, it's coming back a little bit, and it's coming back in ways that probably make a little more scientific sense. Um, certain allergies, you're, Ben, you're asking about allergies. There are certain uh, endotypes of asthma now where there are increased uh, eosinophils, or there are increased IgE, where there's more allergic-driven disease. And in those patients, they actually seem to be the ones that may benefit from blocking IL-4 or uh, IL-5 as part of their treatment. Um, so yes, I think the answer overall will be yes, but it, it's a little more nuanced now. Yeah. Great. Now, another question, though, is any concerns about impairing B cell responses and thus production of neutralizing antibodies against other infections in those who are treated with the IL-4 neutralizing regimen? Wow, that's, a, and, that's and, somebody and who you subtly understands the, the, um, the role of, uh, and, and you know, I'll, I'll help to explain maybe the, the way the question is worded to explain what it means. Uh, as B cells undergo the germinal center response, starting from naive and becoming activated, attracting, uh, being attracted to the follicle where they get help from the helper cells, uh, 
uh, to then undergo the light dark um, uh, expansion and then a somatic hypermutation. That program of, of getting started in the journal term of response is largely IL-4 driven. Uh, sorry, my God, is IL-21 driven. Uh, and, and those people like Albert cells are making IL-21 that help drive that response. Uh, CD40 is needed in CD40 ligand contact on those B cells. There are other cytokines that will push them towards IgE or towards IgA or towards IgG. Uh, but IL-21 is the important uh, driver there. But in, interestingly, in the last few years, we've come to learn that to, for those B cells to leave the germinal center response, to become memory B cells, to become uh, differentiated plasma blasts, uh, they need to switch off IL-21 signaling and start receiving IL-4 signaling. And so um, when I heard about dupilumab and I said, what, we are gonna be blocking all those patients from undergoing their uh, germinal center responses and making really bona fide high affinity class switched IgHGs and vaccine responses should be impaired in those patients. Uh, I asked Regeneron on this question and they did study it and they have not found uh, either IgG levels or, or immunoglobulin levels at all being reduced or specific antibodies being reduced in, in, in the style for uh, neutralizing regimen. Uh, in, in the patients who are getting it for um, eczema and asthma and allergic rhinoconjunctivitis now and polyp disease, it has a number of indications. Um, why? Well, why isn't it doing what we think it's doing? Um, that's a good question. You know, we don't have an answer yet. My, one of my guesses is that the patients who are receiving IL-4 blockade clinically for asthma, for eczema, et cetera, aren't blocking all their IL-4. Uh, you may be blocking some IL-4 and it might be enough to sort of protect from some of these uh, type two phenotypes in the lungs and other tissues, but maybe not blocking uh, activity in the lymph node. Um, we would worry about that in the sort of ultra high levels of IL-4 that we, blockade that we use in our patients. Uh, and I think it is something that we, sh we would have to follow in our, in our trials. I hope yeah, that answers uh, your question. Uh, yeah, no, it's a great, it's a great answer. It's super interesting. The, I have a kind of, uh, you know, maybe tangential question if we have a moment for it, which is that, um, you know, you talked a lot about the genetic uh, um, drivers, and um, I'm wondering about kind of environmental drivers, so such as chronic, you know, people who have had chronic viral infections, or if you've had a severe viral infection, how that might predispose you for future infections, and if that kind of would alter some of these balances. For example, how do these things change with aging, uh, you, know, um, you know, which might kind of look like a, you know, semi-chronic mild immune suppression kind of uh, picture? Yeah, so that's a great question. I think um, some of that overlaps into the world of co-infection, which we, we now know about is, um, is a real thing. There are many patients who get viral infections uh, and then they get co-infected with bacteria after the viral infection. Um, that, that's, um, is the question there is, uh, is there some state of immune response that's driven by the first pathogen that allows for susceptibility to the second pathogen? And, and I think the answer is definitely gonna be yes. Um, you know, these, these uh, type one and type two responses with a broad brush happen to be this sort of broader transcriptional program. But we know that there are tissue specific differences in these programs. Type two immunity, for example, in the GI tract happens to have more skewing uh, of, of producing IL-9. IL-9 is a cytokine that isn't found, uh, you know, in, in other tissues as much. So there, there are like subsets and subsets of subsets of Th1 cells and Th2 cells that are, that are tissue specific. That may then, if you push your immune system too much in that direction, I'm gonna fight this virus today, you may create a little bit of a gap in your ability to have that broader program to fight bacteria. Then you may end up with a viral infection that's followed by a co-infection or a subsequent infection with, with the bacteria. So um, the way you're wording it is like, do they, have, do they have a viral infection that might create a susceptibility to COXI? Uh, I, I think, I think the answer must be yes. Uh, you know, I have, we haven't studied it ourselves, but, um, but I would say that that paradigm of, 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 of the immune system being pushed in one direction and being unable to respond in another um, uh, could be part of it. But yeah, I don't know if that helps, Dan. Yeah, it looks like there are two uh, people who raised their hand, um, oh, Ari Srivast Batson and, 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 you know, if maybe Lucy could unmute them and you could, you know, one at a time, then they could ask their questions. Um, there's Ari, please do. You're, just unmute yourself. Unmute myself. Yeah, Manish, it's a wonderful talk because uh, the last question um, he was asking about the virus, you already have a wonderful system, COVID-19. I mean, they are saying about fungus with uh, black fungus, mucor. What about coxie? Um, Yeah, great question. Uh, to my knowledge, it's only been in India and with mucor that, that um, 
that that has been uh, uh, documented. We haven't seen it, an increase in blasto or histo or cocci in the United States. Uh, I'd okay, be happy to correct it. If somebody, somebody from infectious diseases wants to correct me, uh, I'd be happy to. I, I did think about that and looked into that a, a year ago when we were, when the mucor cases were, were dropping uh, in India. Okay, yeah, that, that might person. be the reason. Oh, oh, that might oh. be the reason. That's a variant, am I right? That itself is a variant. You can yeah. find out why coxie is not there, why mucor is there. Yeah. 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 Great. That's no, good. thanks for that question. I just want to give somebody else a chance. There's a uh, geo. Vanessa has been um, also uh, has their hand raised. Please, please go ahead. I'm so sorry, it was a mistake. Hello. Okay. <laughs> um, we will. Um, okay. That well, that looks. Um, you know, uh, I think. Uh, you know, it is. It is just super interesting, right? How aging. Um, you know, kind of, uh, you know, there's, you know, we generally think about it like general down regulation of the immune system. And I, I just have a sense it's a lot more, you know, specific than that. It may be related to some of these, uh, these kind of, you know, things in these very severe cases that you're seeing, these very obvious cases, right? Yeah, I think aging, aging is another uh, interesting point. Obviously, our index case was a four-year-old, but many of our patients in the disseminated cohort that we've collected from the, the UCOP collective uh, are, are not young, 50s, 60s, 70s. Um, 50s is not old, okay, just to <laughs> I should correct that. Um, COVID also has a very interesting susceptibility to aging, and, um, and it's actually um, logarithmically worse with every de a decade of age. Um, it's, it's fascinating how age is such a risk factor for severe COVID. Uh, and one of the things that, that um, has been discovered that we're part of is uh, a, a, a now an international group has found that autoantibodies against type 1 interferon, the key cytokine needed to protect from viral infections, not gamma that I showed a few minutes ago for COXI, but interferon alpha, those that, that the older you get, the more blocking antibodies you have against interferon uh, alpha. And, um, and those blocking antibodies are bad because then when you get a viral infection like COVID and you need to make those, auto, uh, th those um, interferons to protect you, you're making up an antibody that sort of blocks that response. This is one of the major risk factors for, um, for males in, in elderly years to get severe COVID. Uh, why are males in their elderly years getting these blocking autoantibodies? We don't have an answer for that yet, but it, it's really fascinating. I think age is an important variable that, that we have to keep thinking about. Yeah. Well, thanks a lot, Manish. We've run uh, 10 minutes over time, and that just uh, speaks yeah. to how fa absolutely fascinating the talk was. Thank you so much. Thanks, Dan. Have yeah, a good day, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.